In this short presentation, I want to look at the bond market red flag, yield spreads. Sounds a bit chewy, actually quite important in terms of working out what might happen next and what could go wrong. So, bond vigilantes is the title of this slide. Bond markets often react first and fast to news, and therefore they are particularly useful places to look for trouble. They are quite sensitive to inflation expectation changes and central bank policy. And some people therefore see the bond markets where lots and lots of bright people are focused on bonds of different maturities and so on as the place to look for changing sentiment and things that might have a knock-on effect in terms of the way that equities behave too. Credit spreads are one way of measuring how nervous bond market traders actually are. Just one way, there are others which I'll cover in future videos. And for many investors, this, as I mentioned, is a key early warning sign. So what are these things, yield or credit spreads, and how can you start to think about interpreting them? Well, a quick definition. In essence, and we'll cover elements of this next, a yield spread or a credit spread is the difference in yield, we need to look at which yield in a moment, between two bonds of similar maturity. Got to compare apples with apples, but different credit quality. All right, that's the basic principles. Keep that in mind and let's have a look at what yield we're comparing and what we're trying to get out of this comparison in terms of a message. So, quick refresher. For those people a bit rusty on yields, what do I mean? We're going to take two bonds, compare the yields, look at the gap between the two, but what are we actually comparing? What to what? Well, a yield expresses the annual return on a fixed income security or a fixed income bond as a percentage. And at the end of this presentation, I'll give you some videos to watch if you're a bit rusty on this stuff. Two yields are commonly quoted in relation to fixed income bonds. One, we're not going to pay much time to here, the flat yield, that's the income yield, that just gives you the annual income return on the bond. The other one is the one we want, which is the gross redemption yield. That is the total pre-tax, hence the word gross, return factoring in income and capital gains. So in other words, yield spreads are all about looking at the total yield available on different bonds of similar maturity but different risk profiles and trying to draw some conclusions. Now, if people are a little bit rusty, gross redemption yields, very quick example coming up here, also known by the way as the yield to maturity, YTM, bond markets love their jargon, so gross redemption yield or yield to maturity basically is the total yield taking account of income and capital gains. So, very rough and ready, back of an envelope, Japanese methods slightly ignoring inflation, time value of money, coming up, just to illustrate the point. This isn't the exact science of it, but to give you a flavour for those people who are rusty. Take a five-year, 5% 5 bond, priced at £95, priced below par, priced below its fixed nominal value of £100. As an approximation, the gross redemption yield would be the annual coupon you're expecting, which on this thing is around fiver. Because don't forget, the coupon is calculated in relation to a fixed amount of the bond, which is 100 pounds, not the market price. That's what the bond is worth, not how much of it you're looking at. So it's a fiver, and then we've got to factor in the fact, that's just the income side, that if you can buy something for 95, and it will redeem in five years' time at its nominal value. Key bond principles here of £100. In other words, you know what it's worth on redemption. It's not the current price. It is the £100 redemption value. Then, very roughly speaking, you're making another pound a year. Very roughly speaking, ignoring time, value, and money. You're making a pound a year extra. You're making a pound a year even if there was no coupon because you buy something for 95, cash it in for 100, there's a fiver. So you need to factor that into the yield. Yeah? And to factor it into the yield, very roughly, I've just added five to one to get six, put it over the current price, expressed that as a percentage, and got 6.3%. So when we talk about credit spreads and yield spreads, we're gonna be looking at the number that comes out for one bond and the number that comes out for a, another bond with a similar maturity but a different risk profile and asking the question, what's that going to tell us? By comparing those two numbers and seeing how they're changing, does that give us any useful information as an investor? Not as a bond investor, but potentially as an equity investor too. So, a rough guide to risk. Where are we headed with this? You could, very loosely speaking, divide bonds into about four categories. Ratings agencies spend their lives you know, basically giving bonds a rating, you know, AAA is kind of the highest, 
all the way down to D. This is the Moody's, Standard and Poor's and Fitch's of this world. AAA being fantastic, almost bulletproof if you like, reserved only for the most secure types of bonds in terms of price and default and liquidity risk and so on. So stuff that doesn't move around too much, easy to buy and sell all the rest of it and underlying issuers that are unlikely to go bust, all the way down to D. Now, in theory, governments and corporates can be rated anywhere from AAA all the way down to D. It's not the case that you have to be a government to get a AAA rating, far from. Some governments are rated much lower than that. So we could, loosely speaking, group bonds into core government, really safe governments. UK, US, for example, Western OECD type governments. Um, slightly less safe governments, high quality corporate bonds, lower quality corporate bonds. And very broadly speaking, there's your sort of risk profile, if you like. So, is it any surprise that when we're comparing bonds to each other, people want to benchmark? They want to, be able to say, well, how risky is this bond starting to look compared to something nice and solid? So often when you're looking at yield spreads or credit spreads, what people will do is compare the yield on the thing they're looking at to something really safe, like a 10-year, a sort of medium-term treasury. That's in the US. It's a massive bond market in the US. Or perhaps a 10-year government IOU in the UK. A gilt, depending on what sort of bond you are trying to get a view on. So there you have it. And you know, it stands to reason, common sense says, that if you've got a kind of emerging market government, that bond is going to have a higher yield because it's considered to be riskier than, say, the US government. So you'll get a spread, a gap there. If you were looking at you know, a junk-rated corporate bond compared to a nice, solid, stable company issuing a bond with a similar maturity, you're going to get another spread or gap between the yields over there. So as a rule of thumb, perfectly common sense, the more risky a bond is perceived to be, the higher the return, the total return, income and capital investors will demand for investing in it. So that gives us a clue as to where we're going with credit and yield spreads. Now just a word about how these things are actually quoted, basis points. Very often what confuses people is you won't see a gap between two percentages expressed as a percentage of expressed in basis points. People sometimes think, well, hang on, can I deal with that? Well, actually, you can. It's a very simple system here, and it's worth being aware of. It's used elsewhere, too. Basically, 1% is 100 basis points. Very simple system. So if a fixed income security has a yield of 2.5%, another way of saying that quickly is 250 basis points. A 50 basis point move is the equivalent of half a percent in layman's terms, so that would take you from 2.5% to 3%. So just be aware that yields and yield spreads are often referred to in basis points rather than percentages. Don't let that put you off. And now we can start to draw some conclusions about what would be a sort of warning sign in terms of the way these things move, because the gap between uh, two yields could be widening, all right, where the risk of the bond that's not the benchmark bond, not the bog standard safe US or UK bond is perceived to be growing, or it could be narrowing where the opposite is the case. All right, because if you think about it, if investors are feeling pretty sort of bullish, the aggressive, they'll go out and buy riskier bonds, drive up the price, drive down the yield, and maybe push the yield in closer to the benchmark safe bond. If they're getting nervous, they'll be dumping risky bonds. By dumping risky bonds, they drive down the price drive up the yield, and that's going to widen the spread. So you can see where this is going, potentially, in terms of red flag signs, which I'll summarise in just a moment. Now, yield spread. So here we go. It's the difference between two yields, usually expressed in basis points. All right. So a very, you know, a very small gap might be sort of five bips basis points. A big one might be 400 basis points. But the big one could also be expressed as 4%, it's just that it typically isn't, it's in basis points. So if a 10-year government yield, sorry, GILT yields 2%, 200 basis points, and a 10-year Portuguese equivalent, it's important to compare like with like, by the way, yields 2.9% or 290 basis points, that gives you a 90 basis point gap. The wider that is, the riskier the non-benchmark bond is thought to be. All right, so we're using a 10-year UK government IOU, because we're in Europe, we could use the US, no reason why not, all right, to benchmark the Portuguese equivalent. 
and bear, um, you know, watch that we have picked bonds with a similar maturity 10 year. It wouldn't really be right to compare you know, a 10 year UK to a five year Portuguese. That's kind of apples and pears. And the bigger that gap, the riskier that bond potentially is, or the more fear there is in the market about that particular type of bond. So basically, to use the jargon, if that gap were to move down to 80 basis points, less than 1%, the spread, not surprisingly, is said to have narrowed. All right? Maybe there's less fear in the market, less nervousness. If, on the other hand, the spread has got bigger, then it's said to have widened. So we're talking about relative risk. All right? So more fear, spreads tend to widen. Less fear, spreads tend to narrow. So there is a potential red flag, a sudden or unexpected widening of spreads. Now, it can happen in different parts of the market. It may be that in the sovereign market, suddenly you've got nervousness about you know, peripheral countries, uh, the Greece's, the Portugal's, and the Spain's, and so on. So suddenly that widens the spread. Or perhaps you've got the opposite. Perhaps the investors are feeling more confident. That will tend to narrow the spread. All right? Complicated, of course, when central banks intervene and start buying these bonds, because that's going to push up the price and drive down the yield and narrow spreads anyway. So quite a few factors can influence these things, these spreads, but an unexpected widening, that's the key, is one red flag for sure. And then volatility in a traditionally stable relationship. So maybe the spread on two bonds, whether it's two different types of government, two different types of company, has been relatively stable, pottering along at a certain level, and suddenly it starts to get very volatile, starts to concertina in or out. Volatility is often another red flag, not, in, not just in this part of the market, but in any part of the market. So there's another thing to keep an eye on. Now, we'll do this in a bit more depth in future videos. That gives you a flavour for a fairly key bond market red flag. And there are other red flags also coming up in future videos. If you're thinking, oh, that stuff at the beginning was a bit quick, then do go back and look at what are fixed income securities, the basics. If you found the yield stuff a bit quick, do go back to the rewards and risks video. That's an earlier one in the Killick Explained series. And do take a look, if you're interested in risks, at my duration, the word every bond investor should understand, video two. So there you have it, one way to spot potential trouble emanating out of one of the most important markets in the world.